27 years ago, when civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, grief and frustration erupted in America's cities. And far away in Iowa, one third grade teacher knew she had to do something. The shooting of Martin Luther King could not just be talked about and explained away. There was no way to explain this to little third graders in Riceville, Iowa. I knew that it was time to deal with this in a concrete way, not just talk about it, because we had talked about racism since the first day of school. This is a fact. Blue-eyed people are better than brown-eyed people. It was a daring experiment oh, yes, in prejudice. I watched wonderful, thoughtful children turn into nasty, vicious, discriminating little third graders. Can one teacher, in one day, change the lives of her students forever? Tonight, a class divided. August, 1984. A high school reunion brings some 50 former students to Riceville, Iowa. 11 of them, some with their spouses and children, arrive early for a special reunion with their former third grade teacher, Jane Elliott. Fourteen years earlier, when they were students in her third grade classroom, ABC News filmed a two-day exercise for a documentary, The Eye of the Storm. Now, at their request, they will see that film again and relive the experience of her unique lesson in discrimination. Special week. Does anybody know what it is? National Brotherhood. National Brotherhood Week. What's brotherhood? Be kind to your brothers. Be, be kind okay, be kind brothers. to your brothers. Like you would like to be treated. Treat everyone the way you would like to be treated. Treat everyone as though he was your brother. brother. And is there anyone in this United States that we do not treat as our brothers? Yes. Who? Yes. The, the, black people. People. the black people. Who else? In Absolutely, the Indians. And when you see, when many people see a black person or a yellow person or a red person, what do they think? Oh, oh look at that. Dumb people. And look at the dumb people. What else do they think sometimes? What kinds of things do they say about black people? Oh, they're niggers, niggers. In the city, many places in the United States, how are black people treated? How are Indians treated? How are people who are of a different color than we are treated? Like they, like like they are part of this place. world. They don't get anything in this world. Like Why is that? Because they're different color. You think you know how that would feel yeah. to be judged by the color of your skin? Yeah. I don't, do you think you do? No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? <laughs> It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah! Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Since I'm the teacher and I have blue eyes, I think maybe the blue-eyed people should be on top the first day. I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Oh, yes, they are. Mm. Yeah. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. <laughs> My dad isn't that stupid. Are, is your dad brown-eyed? Yeah. One day you came to school and you told us that he kicked you. He did. Do you think a blue-eyed father would kick his son? Yeah. My dad. My dad. My dad's blue-eyed. Blue He's <laughs> never kicked me. Greg's dad is blue-eyed. He's never kicked him. Rex's dad is blue-eyed. He's never kicked him. This 
this is a this is a fact. Blue-eyed people are better than brown-eyed people. Are you brown-eyed or blue-eyed? Blue. Why are you shaking your head? <laughs> are you sure that you're right? Why? What makes you so sure that you're right? I don't know. The blue-eyed people get five extra minutes of recess, while the brown-eyed people have to stay in. Mm. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You'll have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground because you are not as good as blue-eyed people. Well, the brown-eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. Yeah. On page 127. 100. 127. Yeah. Is everyone ready? Everyone but Laurie. Ready, Laurie? She's brown-eyed. She's a brown-eyed. You'll begin to notice today that we spend a great deal of time waiting for brown-eyed people. The yardstick's gone. Well, okay. I don't see the yardstick, do you? It's probably over there. Hey, Mrs. Lake, you better keep that on your desk so if the um, brown people, brown-eyed people get out of hand. Oh! You think if the brown-eyed people get out of hand, that would be the thing to use? Who goes first to lunch? Blue the blue-eyed people. No brown-eyed people go back for seconds. Blue-eyed people may go back for seconds. Brown-eyed people do not. Brown -eyed. Don't you know? Oh, they're not smart. Is that the only reason? It might take too much. Okay, quietly. And it seemed like when we were down on the bottom, everything bad was happening to us. The way they treated you, you felt like you didn't even want to try to do anything. It seemed like Mrs. Elliott was taking our best friends away from us. What happened at recess? Were two of you boys fighting? Yeah. Jack. Russell and John were. Russell. What happened, John? Russell called me names and I hit him. Hit him in the gut. Oh. What did he call you? Brown eyes. Did you call him brown eyes? They always call us that. You yeah. want to get all of the. Um, yeah, you always call us that. They call us brown eyes. They say, come here, brown eyes. Yeah. And they would call us blue eyes. I yeah. wasn't. Sandy. Sandy and Donna were. Yeah. What's wrong with being called brown eyes? It means that we're stupider. No, well, not that. Yeah. But oh, that's mean. just the same yeah. way as other people call uh, black people niggers. Yeah. Is that the reason you hit him, John? Did it help? Did it stop him? Did it make you feel better inside? Russell. Make you feel better inside? Did it make you feel better to call him brown eyes? Why do you suppose you call him brown eyes? Right, because he has brown eyes. Is that the only reason? He didn't call him brown eyes yesterday, and he had brown eyes yesterday. Didn't he? Because we just saw Yeah, that. ever since you put those blue things on there. Yeah. Tease him. Kind of tease him. Oh, is this teasing? No. Well, he did it. Well, were you doing it for fun, to be funny, or were you doing it to be mean? I don't know. Don't ask me. Did anyone laugh at you when you did it? I watched what had been marvelous, cooperative, wonderful, thoughtful children turn into nasty, vicious, discriminating, little third graders in a space of 15 minutes. Yesterday, I told you that brown-eyed people aren't as good as blue-eyed people. That wasn't true. I lied to you yesterday. The truth is 
that brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. <laughs> Russell, where are your glasses? I forgot them. You forgot them, and what color are your eyes? Blue. <laughs> Susan Ginder has brown eyes. She didn't forget her glasses. Yeah. Russell Ring has blue eyes, and what about his glasses? He forgot them. He forgot them. Yesterday, we were visiting, and Greg said, boy, I like to hit my little sister as hard as I can. That's fun. What does that tell you about blue-eyed people? They're naughty. In fact, they fight a lot. <laughs> the brown-eyed people may take off their collars, and each of you may put your collar on a blue-eyed person. The brown-eyed people get five extra minutes of recess. You blue-eyed people are not allowed to be on the playground equipment at any time. You blue-eyed people are not to play with the brown-eyed people. Brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. They are smarter than blue-eyed people. And if you don't believe it, look at Brian. Do blue-eyed people know how to sit in a chair? Very sad. Very, very sad. Who can tell me what contraction should be in the first sentence? Go to the board and write it, John. <laughs> Come on, let's do it again. Loosen up. Up, up, up. Come on. That's better now. Do you know how to make a W? OK, write the contraction for we are. Now, that's beautiful writing. Is that better? Yes. Brown-eyed people learn fast, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Boy, do brown-eyed people learn fast. Very good. Greg, what did you do with that cup? Will you please go and get that cup? and put your name on it and keep it at your desk. Blue-eyed people are wasteful. OK, you want to be timed this morning? Yeah. A. I use Orton Gillingham Phonics. We use the card pack. And the children, the brown-eyed children, were in the low class the first day. And it took them five and a half minutes to get through the card pack. The second day, it took them two and a half minutes. The only thing that had changed was the fact that now they were superior people. I thought we were going to get more. You went faster than I ever had anyone go through the card pack. Over the why, why couldn't you get them yesterday? We were going to have the collars on. We you think the collars get, kept you? just through? keep thinking about the collars. Oh. Like that, like, and I might, I could get rolling around. Oh, and you couldn't think as well with the collars on. Well, Four minutes and 18 seconds. I know we weren't going to make it. How long did it take you yesterday? Three minutes. Three minutes. How long did it take you today? Four, four, four minutes, minutes and 18 seconds. seconds. What happened? One down. Why? What were you thinking of? This. I hate today. How do you do? I hate to. <laughs> because I'm blue-eyed. See, I am too. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's nothing, it's not funny, it's not fun, it's not pleasant. This is a filthy, nasty word called discrimination. We're treating people a certain way because they are different from the rest of us. Is that fair? No. 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 Nothing fair about it. We didn't say this was going to be a fair day, did we? No. no. And it isn't. It's a horrid day. OK, you ready? What did you blue people who are wearing blue collars now find out today? Oh, you feel I know what yeah. they felt like to yesterday. I did, too. How did they feel yesterday? Down. It's like a dog on a leash. Yeah. It feels like, like a chain them up wherever you go. In the prison. Like you're chaining them up in the prison. Like you're shot and you're, and you're throwing the key away. Should the color of some other person's eyes have anything to do with no. how you treat them? No. All right, then should the color of their skin? No. Should you judge people no. by the color no. of their skin? No. no. 
you're going to say that today and this week and probably all the time you're in this room he'll say no mrs ellie no. every time i ask that question no Ms. then no, Ms. when you see a black man or an indian or someone walking down the street are you going to say <laughs> look at that silly looking thing no, no. no. Does it make any difference whether their skin is black or white? No. Or yellow? No. no. Or red? No. Is that how you decide whether people are good or bad? No. Is that what makes people good or bad? No. Let's take these collars off. Hey, don't stick yourself out there. You'd have to sort them out. you can What would you like to do with them? Throw them away. Go ahead. Go ahead. In the pit. Is it eat them? Now you know a little bit more than you knew yeah. at the beginning of this week? Yeah. Yes. A lot. Do you know a little bit more than you wanted to? Yes. yes. This isn't an easy way to learn this, is it? No. here together blue eyes and brown eyes that make any difference what color you are no no down girl don't see him yet oh you found your friend huh now you get did you get that okay you ready to listen now okay now are you back yes that feel better yes that's a color you have make any difference in the kind of person you are? No, Miss Sally. Does that feel like being home again, girls? Yes. yes. Oh, well, you stop it. <laughs> this was the third time Jane Elliott had taught her lesson in discrimination. The first, two years earlier, was in April of 1968. On the day after Martin Luther King was killed, my, one of my students came into the room and said, they shot a king last night, Mrs. Elliott. Why'd they shoot that king? I knew the night before that it was time to deal with this in a concrete way, not just talk about it, because we had talked about racism since the first day of school. But the shooting of Martin Luther King, who had been one of our heroes of the month in February, could not just be talked about and explained away. There was no way to explain this to little third graders in Riceville, Iowa. As I listened to the white male commentators on TV the night before, I was hearing things like, who's going to hold your people together as they interviewed black leaders? Uh, what are they going to do? Uh, who's going to control your people? As though this was, uh, these people were subhuman and someone was going to have to step in there and control them. They said things like, when we lost our leader, his widow helped to hold us together. Who's going to hold them together? And the attitude was so arrogant and so condescending and so ungodly that I thought if white male adults react this way, what are my third graders going to do? How are they going to react to this thing? I was ironing the teepee. We studied an Indian unit. We made a teepee every year. The first year, the students would make the teepee out of pieces of sheet. We'd sew it together. And the next year, we'd decorate it with Indian symbols. I was ironing the previous year's teepee, getting it ready to be decorated the next day. And I thought of what we had done with the Indians. We haven't made much progress in these 200, 300 years. And I thought this is the time now to teach them really what the Sioux Indian prayer that says, oh great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I have walked in his moccasins really means. And for the next day, I knew that my children were going to walk in someone else's moccasins for a day. Like it or lump it, they were going to have to walk in someone else's moccasins. I decided at that point that it was time to try the eye color thing, which I had thought about many, many times, but had never used. So the next day, I introduced an eye color exercise in my classroom and split the class according to eye color, and immediately created a microcosm of society in a third grade classroom. Riceville hasn't changed much in the 17 years since then. It's still a small farming community surrounded by cornfields. Its population is still under 1,000 and it's still all white and all Christian. 
And though Jane Elliott has continued to teach her lesson in discrimination, there has been little outward local reaction. No objections from school authorities or the parents of the 300-odd students who have by now been through it. Okay, let's, let's get in a circle. The reunion of her former third graders was Jane Elliott's first chance to find out how much of her lessons her students had retained. All right, now, Raymond, why? I want to know why you were so eager to discriminate against the rest of these kids. At the end of the day, I thought the miserable little Nazi. <laughs> really, I just, I couldn't stand you. It felt tremendously evil. <laughs> you could... All your inhibitions were gone, and no matter if they were my friends or not, any pent-up hostilities or aggressions that these kids had ever caused you, you had a chance to get it all out. I felt like I was a king, like I ruled them brown eyes, like I was better than them, happy. You know? And you did it all day. Yeah. How did you feel when you were the out group? Boy, that day, after we went home, <laughs> and talk about hating somebody, yeah. it was there. You hated me. Yeah, of what you were putting us through. Nobody likes to be looked down upon. Nobody likes to be hated, teased, or discriminated against. And it just boggles up inside of you. You, you just get so mad. Were you just angry, or was there more than that? I felt demoralized humiliated. Is the learning worth the agony? Yes. 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 It made everything a lot different than what it was. You, uh, we was a lot better family altogether, even in our houses we was probably. Because uh, it, it was hard on you. When you have your best friend one day and then he's your enemy the next, it brings it out real, real quick in you. I, I don't know if that's a Some of the remarks were the kinds of things I would have wished I could have programmed into them if I had been able to program them. They're the things I would have wanted them to say. Some of the things were just mind-blowing. You know, you hear these people talking about, uh, you know, different people, and how they're, you know, they're different, and they'd like to have a model country. I wish they'd go back to Africa, you know, and stuff. And, Sometimes I just wish I had that collar in my pocket. I could whip it out and put it on and say, wear this and put, your, put yourself in their place. I wish they would go what I went, well, you know, do what I went through. We was at a softball game a couple weekends ago, and there was a black young like, hi, Verla, you know, and we hugged each other and everything. And some people really looked just like, what are you doing with him, you know? And you just get this burning feeling, sensation in you that you just want to let it out and put them through what we went through to find out they're not any different. I still find myself sometimes when I see some people together and I see how they act, you know, I think, well, that's black. And then right in the next second, I don't even finish the thought. I'm saying, well, I've seen whites do it. I've seen other people do it. It's not just the blacks. It's everyone acts differently. It's just a different color is what hits you first. And then later, as I said, I don't even finish that thought before I remember back when I was like that. And then I remember not, you know, everyone acts the same way. It's just your way of thinking is a difference. Like when my grandparents or somebody and they start talking about old times and they say the Japs and all this and that, and they start, you know, holding that against them, I think, how would you like to have been them? Japanese Americans get thrown into this camp just because they happen to be part Japanese. You know, I, I just said, calm down and think about it. But when they get older, they set in their ways, and they're not going to change. When you get older? <laughs> I'll be set in my ways, but they're different than their ways. When people I was get older, absolutely they get enthralled. Sandy Dolman's statements that when my son comes home with the word nigger and the other things that he hears downtown, I say to him, listen, that isn't the way we judge people. You don't judge people by how they look. You judge them by what's on their inside, not their outside. I'm glad that she's teaching him not to hate, because even though he does hear this from the other people, he, if he goes home and he thinks, well, oh, mom and dad, dad like the black people, I'm going to like them too. So I don't think he's going to pick nothing bad up out of it. 
You chose your husband well. <laughs> he chose me. You chose me well. <laughs> Little guess... kids will take and, you know, they'll listen to a lot of other people, too, and so they're going to end up kind of confused over it. But you if know, she right keeps on telling yeah. him, is he okay, going to be gonna... the kind of person you kids are, or is he going to be the kind who judge people by the Well, he'll know them? right, somewhat right from wrong. He'll know, you know that he won't. But he'll have the, the ideas. He won't be judging them by their color, but he won't know what we know fully, having been through it. He won't learn the color from them. The prejudice no, from us. He won't, he won't learn prejudice first-handed. Yeah. yeah. He just... won't learn to be prejudiced from us. I mean, he, they won't learn to discriminate between people from us. They might, he might hear it from others, but never from us. Okay, what's it like to be married to somebody like that? <laughs> when I was going to marry Sheila, I knew I, for my future that I was going into the military. At first, I thought, is she going to be able to handle being with all the different nationalities? And then I read the storm, read the, the book. A class divided. The class divided before we got married and before I joined the army. And I said, hey, she's not going to have any problems. Should every, should every child have the exercise, or should every teacher? Everybody. Everybody, Everybody. 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 not yeah. just. Everybody. I think every school ought to implement something like this program in their, in their early stages of education. If Jane Elliott's lesson in discrimination changed the way these young people feel about discrimination and racism, it also had a totally unexpected result. The second year I did this exercise, I gave little spelling tests, math tests, reading tests, two weeks before the exercise, each day of the exercise and two weeks later. And almost without exception, the students' scores go up on the day they're on the top down on the day they're on the bottom, and then maintain a higher level for the rest of the year after they've been through the exercise. We sent some of those tests to um, Stanford University, to the psychology department, and they did a sort of an informal review of them. And they said that what's happening here is kids' academic ability is being changed in a 24-hour period, and that isn't possible, but it's happening. Something very strange is happening to these children because suddenly they're finding out how really great they are, and they are responding to what they know now they are able to do. And it, it has happened consistently with third graders. The film made of Jane Elliott's third graders in 1970 has been widely used with students and teachers, and by government, business, and labor organizations concerned about human relations. Perhaps the most unusual use of it is here, at Greenhaven Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison in Stormville, New York. Here, in a sociology course taught by Professor Dwayne W. Smith of Dutchess Community College, his almost exclusively black and Hispanic classes have been seeing the film for more than 10 years. What I'd like to do is uh introduced the subject of prejudice and discrimination through this film called The Eye of the Storm. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. Oh. They are cleaner than brown-eyed people. Oh. They are more civilized than brown-eyed people. Sandra and her brown-eyed friends didn't like that day, but Raymond did. It felt like a, like, king, like a... Do you think the children, by this process, really learned the meaning of discrimination? Most of the children, before the film started, they had played and lived together in harmony. And a certain action of coming from the teacher and seeing the teacher as an authoritarian figure and someone to respect, they accepted the views that was being given to them. But I think in the, in the, at the end of the lesson, they, they could clearly see that prejudices and other forms of discrimination are things that people build within their minds, that they're not actual, actual physical barriers that say, yo, you can't cross the street. The one kid I could really agree with was at recess. He was a brown-eyed kid. He had this inner turmoil against this feeling of being 
divided or prejudiced against where he would hit a, another kid that he's known for so many years in the gut. Whether he also stated that it didn't help any. So that automatically should be a lesson to every adult in the world. Violence doesn't help any. And you know, I, this is a film that I hope that my children get to see. Unlike New York, Iowa is 98% white Anglo-Saxon. Yet even here, minority groups account for more than 20% of the prison population. To make sure its prison system employees are sensitive to the concerns of this large minority, the Iowa Department of Corrections last fall hired Jane Elliott to give her lesson to some of them. The group, which included prison guards and parole officers, was told only that it would be attending a day-long workshop. David Stokesbury. Most of our training you go to, people give you information and you learn that way. Luai? When I first came uh, <clears throat> with the sign up and such and, and got put in the group, I didn't know uh, when I started seeing the signs around, you know, brown eyes only and such. I figured they were the uh, better group because they had a lot of spaces available and uh, and there were none for the blue eyes. So um, when I got put in the blue eyes group and put the collar on, then I, I knew, well, then I was going to be in, in the deprived group, I guess. Okay, now you can stay in this area. The workshop was supposed to begin at 9. Uh, they took the brown eyes in about 9 and then left us standing in the hall. I literally stood because there weren't enough chairs and I didn't know whether or not I'd wanted to fight to take a chair down. I didn't know if somebody would come and take the chair away from me if I did. While David Stokesbury and the other blue-eyed people waited inside the meeting room, Jane Elliott prepared the brown-eyed people for what was going to happen. Now, this is not something I can do alone. This exercise won't work without your cooperation. Blue-eyed people aren't allowed to smoke. Blue-eyed people aren't allowed to sit in these empty chairs. Do not let a blue-eyed person sit next to you. You know you can't trust them. And besides which, they don't smell good. Everybody knows that about blue-eyed people. You don't know what you can catch from a blue-eyed person. By 9.20, I felt some antagonism. You know, I'm stuck out here for 20 minutes, standing, waiting. I still say we ought to see what kind of a reaction we'd get by everyone just simply going in. No one wants to do it? Everybody seems to have courage and their conviction to do a lot of talking, but nobody takes it and by all singing a song or doing something really loud, you know. We shall overcome. Yeah, right. <laughs> I need to have you keep it down. I don't know how many times I need to give that instruction, but you need to keep it down so you don't bother the people in the, in the workshop. I was pretty well ticked off by the time we got taken in there. Oh, person's in overcoat in the corner here. Oh, I need to have you put your purse in your coat in the corner. Purse in coat in the corner. Purse in your coat in the corner. Purse in your coat in corner. It would be to your advantage in the future, people, if you'd get to meetings on time. And it would also be to your advantage if you'd put your gum away. Put your gum away. If you want to get paid for today? Well, then stay, but put your gum away. I don't have a purse, so I don't have a place to put my gum. I'm sure that you are inventive enough to find a place for the gum. Now, I'd like for you to notice where she put her gum. You have this problem with blue-eyed people. You give them, give them something decent and they just wreck it. You'll also notice that blue-eyed people spend a lot of time playing, look at me, see how cute I am. I can be funny, I can make a joke of this. This is amusing, I'm amused by this. Another thing that is obvious about blue-eyed people is that they're poor listeners. The first thing you have to do when you get when you're teaching in a segregated situation, when you're working in a segregated situation, is teach the listening skills. The listening skills are, number one, good listeners have quiet hands, feet, and mouths. Everyone needs to write these down. I'd like for you to look at the man in the back, in the black jacket. The game we're playing is playing it cool. This is a favorite blue-eyed game, playing it cool. Nobody can bother me, man. I can handle this. I don't have to do this. I'm going to ignore this whole thing. Number two, good listeners keep their eyes on the person who is speaking. I take it you don't have a pencil. Nor you? No. Perhaps you could borrow one from one of your neighbors. Sir, 
I realize that you feel that you don't need to write it down. But whether or not you write it down, perhaps you could remember it. Good listeners have quiet hands, feet, and mouths. Do you know what that means? I'm not sure. I believe that. Do you want me to explain it to you? No, that's okay. I'll get a pencil and write this down directly. Uh, look, blue-eyed people, all many of you have pencils. Will one of you please lend him a pencil, or don't you trust him? Which I can understand. From the last 10 minutes, what have you observed about blue-eyed people? Blue-eyed people are very stubborn, very self-centered, and wish to control as much of their surrounding as possible, people that wise, I mean. Very inconsiderate people. I don't even know why you have them here in the first place. We have them here because we are required to have them here. Oh, we have to, huh? This is um, one of the things you have to put up with. Oh. Number three, good listeners, listen from the beginning to the very end. Okay, good listeners, decide to learn something. <clears throat> And this is the thing you'll have the most difficulty with with blue-eyed people. They decide not to learn something. Some of you have had trouble with blue-eyed people in your home environment. Some of you have had trouble with blue-eyed people in your workplace. Does anybody have an, an example of that that they'd like to talk about? Anyone? I have two nephews, one's blue-eyed and one's brown-eyed. And the blue-eyed one, like, he never cleans his room and he's real lazy. And the brown, you know, he doesn't seem to have a lot of energy, the blue eye one. Um, but the brown eye one, he's real outgoing and he plays in sports and that. He's pretty good at it. And um, he just seems like a better kid. So if I have kids, I hope they have brown eyes. You, are you married? No. Then it's a good thing you don't have kids, isn't it? Right. Well, you will know what to do when it's, when you choose a mate. Right. Would you like to read that first listening skill to me again? I haven't got it on my paper yet. Oh, why is that? <clears throat> I haven't uh, borrowed the pencil to write it down as yet. Uh, do you think it's unnecessary? At this particular point, yes, I do. Why? Um, well, I, I have it in my head for the most part. There's I a lot of space up there for it, isn't there, friend? Um, do you suppose you could tell me what it is? It has something to do with keeping your hands and feet still, as It has I something to do with that. <laughs> I find it interesting that you're amused by our having to stand here and wait for this man to do something that everybody else has already done. I find that highly interesting. Stupid, but interesting. If, if you are in a situation where someone is constantly, constantly, refusing to do what the people in authority ask them to do. What do you know about them? What do you know about that person? Well, I think it's a game with them, uh, attention. Has it gained anything for this gentleman? Disrespect mm -hmm. from, I think, the brown-eyed people. Has it proven anything to brown-eyed people? Yes, it, this is a typical uh, trait uh, of a blue-eyed person. I'll read the second one. I don't have the second one. Can I read it off her? You don't have the second one either. No. You, have, you were keeping it in your head. What happened to that plan? Just the, just the first one I had in my head, not the oh, second one. Oh, the other three aren't important? Well, they're probably important. But not important enough for you to write down, right? Well, they're important. I should have written them down most probably. Most probably. Does anybody back there know? You don't have it written down either. I want you to take a look at these two so-called gentlemen. Now, we need to hear the good listening skills from you. I don't want you to think that I'm badgering you boys. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you're here to learn something. And if you learn nothing else today, it would be nice if you would learn the listening skills. What do you know now about brown-eyed people that you didn't know before you, about blue-eyed people that you didn't know before you came in here? I, I'm finding I'm gonna have to explain things a bit more explicitly to a blue-eyed person than I would to a brown-eyed person. How many times did I have to repeat the listening skills for Roger? 
Well, Brother Roger is having a rough time of day, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> it was about six or seven different times. You think that's amusing, Roger? Apparently, uh, somewhat amusing. <laughs> As part of the lesson, the corrections department employees took a written test. All right, I need these names and the scores. Uh, I have KR11. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. KR, just initials, 11. Just KR, just an initial, no yeah, last name? No names. How many? Uh, 11. And Churden or Charles, I'm not sure. Thank one. you, sir. Tell me the name again. Uh, Churden. You can't read the name? No, I can't. I can't make it up. What's your name? My name is Chambers. First name? Janine. And what was her score? Six. Next. E. Riley with a five. E. E. Riley. Will E. Riley please stand? Fine. You know, it's what you do to the image of blues with your behavior is unfortunate. What you three people do to the image of women with your behavior really makes me angry. The fact that you do this kind of thing and this kind of sloppy work reflects badly on women. I resent that doubly. Yes. Um, Ma'am, I'd really appreciate it if you'd call us by name. When you say you three people, we don't know who you're speaking to. It could be anyone here. My dear, if you wanted me to call you by name, you'd have put your name on your paper. It's on my... It was to be on your paper. You didn't see my papers, ma'am. I didn't get your name either because it wasn't on your paper. That's right. All right, now how can one call you by your name if you don't care enough about your name to put it on your paper? Don't expect don't me to worry me. about it. Don't expect me to worry about it if you don't put it on your paper. Don't sit here and say, my name is important to me, after you have just deliberately not put it on your paper. I you're don't being remember totally saying unrealistic. My name was important to me. I remember saying, I like to know who you're speaking to you when you say you three. Then what should you do? Ask you to use my name, which I did. And where should your name have been? Right where it is. On your paper? And on my birth certificate. Is it on your paper? No, ma'am. Where'd you get a birth certificate? Same place you got. Out of a slot machine, same as you did, lady. <laughs> I think you're probably right about your own. At least what I know who my woman? parents are, ma'am. <laughs> is she being rude? Yes. She being inconsiderate? Very. She being uncooperative? Very. She being insultive? Yes. Are all those the things that we've accused blue-eyed people of being? Yes. Is she proving that we're right? True. Yes. <coughs> Does anyone have any comments to make at this point? Do you feel that there are important blue-eyed people? There are exceptions to every rule. And what are those exceptions? There are a few important blue-eyed people. Very few. You Do said you think that. that you're one of them? No. <laughs> That's then why good. are you up there then? I'm blue-eyed. The difference between you and me is I have a brown-eyed husband and brown-eyed offspring, and I've learned how to behave in a brown-eyed society. And when you can act brown enough, then you too can be where I am. I wouldn't want to be where you are. Are you certain? No. Absolutely positive. You like where you are? I love where I am. You like it so much that you don't even identify yourself on your papers? I don't need to, lady. Her using the term lady, where I'm concerned, what do you think she's trying to do? I is it ignorance or is it deliberately insulting? I would say it was deliberately insulting. If it's ignorance, she needs to be taught that to many of us, the word lady is a pejorative. I don't appreciate it. It is, um, it's a put down and it's used to keep women in their place. The correct name. I'm sorry. I will call you by a correct name after this. I won't be kind. That was kindness on your part? Yes. Then I you are calling true. calling someone a lady is a kindness. Then your problem is ignorance. You can call me lady anytime you like. I wouldn't do that to you. No, I know you wouldn't. I really wouldn't. I, I think that, and that's part of the problem, is a total lack of awareness at what sexism amounts to and how much you contribute to the sexism that keeps you where you are. Not I enough. like where I am, lady. 
I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> yes. I'm getting kind of fed up with this whole bunch of garbage. Uh, Why? The brown eyed peoples are, are, are no different than uh, we are. I hate to tell them that. They, they have these false delusions and such. Are they being disrupted? No, you trained them very well. Uh, I think that's what they did with the stormtroopers in Germany also. You guys do a real good job you sitting up there. You think what's happening here today feels like it would have felt in Nazi Germany? Yes, sir. Where, where do you think you are in that then? Where do I think I am? Who are you if you're in Nazi Germany? Who are you? Uh, the Jews. Uh, <laughs> After a break for lunch, Jane Elliott helped the corrections department employees analyze what had happened. Did you learn anything this morning? I think I learned from the experience of feeling like I was in a glass cage and I was powerless. There was a sense of hopelessness. Uh, I was angry, I wanted to speak up, and yet I, at times I knew if I spoke up, I'd be back in a powerless situation. I'd be attacked. Uh, a sense of hopelessness. Had you ever? Had you experienced that before? I realized this morning that there were very few times in my life that I've ever been discriminated against, very few. And you were this uncomfortable in an hour and a half? I was amazed at how uncomfortable I was in the first 15 minutes. Can you empathize at all then with blacks, minority group members in this country? I'm hoping better than before. If we tried to argue with you, you, you would use... Uh... <coughs> Just the mere argument as, as reason for us being uh, lesser than the uh, brown-eyed folks. You know, you couldn't win. Yeah, don't we do that every day? Uh, I, think, I think some do, yeah. But I, I would hope that I'd never get so unreasonable. I'd, I'd, you know, the, the statements you were making were, were groundless and such, and yet we couldn't argue with them because if we argued, then we were argumentative and, and uh, you know, uh, not listening and, and getting out of our place and all that stuff and and uh, that was frustrating to me and then frustrating to me was the other little green tags who were sitting on their hands my group here was uh, i didn't think uh, boisterous enough in our opposition to the whole thing why didn't you people support one another why didn't the blue-eyed people the blue-eyed people on this side just sat there and let's face it you covered your asses right <laughs> Why did you just sit there? Well, I think that's symptomatic of the problem as a whole. We see that, you know, in society in general. We see a few people who are making a lot of noise, and the rest of the people sitting back waiting to see what they're going to do. Okay, as long as I was picking on you, him, I was leaving you alone, right? Right. I'd say a lot of people accept that. They let have a few people do their fighting for them, and, and they stand back, and, and if this person's going to win, then they'll get on this side. Mm -hmm. But if that person's not going to win, They'll stay back over here, you know. That's just how it works. If you were in a real situation where you had to do something about racism, would you, would you stand up and be counted? What I would do, I don't know. It would depend on the exigencies. But you would do <laughs> something. I would have to do something. I couldn't go home tonight and face my kids if I didn't. How did you brown-eyed people feel while this was going on? Embarrassed. Sense of relief that wasn't a blue-eyed person. Sense Sorry. of relief that you had the right color eyes. <laughs> Absolutely. I really understood, at least I felt that I understood, what it was like to be in the minority. I Why were you angry? First of all, because it was unreasonable. Secondly, because I felt discriminated against. Thirdly, I think that all of us, everyone in this room, has dealt with discrimination on both sides. You don't have to be black or Jewish or Mexican or anything else to have felt discrimination in your life. And as you become an adult, you learn to deal with those feelings within yourself. You learn to handle those. And when you feel yourself uh, in a situation that you can't get out of, which we couldn't, we were a captive audience. And it was not a normal situation, because normally you aren't badgered. What if um, you had to spend the rest of your life this way? I don't know how to answer that. You don't wake up every morning knowing that you're different. You wake up as a white woman who is going to her job at 8 o'clock or whatever, where a black person is going to wake up knowing from the minute they get up out of the bed and look in the mirror, they're black. And they have to deal with the problems they've had to deal with ever since they were young and realize that I am different and I have to deal with life differently. Things are different for me. And I don't think you can really say that you have felt, maybe you have felt some sort of discrimination, but you haven't felt 
what it is like for a black woman to, to go through the daily experiences of uh, arguing and saying, listen to me, M my point of view is good, you know, what I have to offer here is good. And no one wants to listen because white is right. That's the way things are. I think the necessity for this exercise is a crime. No, I don't want to see it used more widely. I want to see it's the necessity for it wiped out. And I think if educators were determined that we could be very instrumental in wiping out the necessity for this exercise. But I want to see something used. I'd like to see this exercise used with all teachers, all administrators, but certainly not with all students unless, unless it's done by people who are doing it for the right reasons and in the right, right way. I think you could damage a child with this exercise very, very easily. And I, I would never suggest that everybody should use it. Um, I think you could have training classes for teachers, bring them in, put them through the thing, explain what happened, do the debriefing, and then practice doing this until teachers, until a group of teachers were able to do it on their own. And I, the teachers are not disabled learners. <laughs> they could learn to do this, obviously. If I can do it, most anyone can do it. It doesn't take a super teacher to do this exercise. What began in a third grade classroom has spread from students to teachers to corrections officers. At the center is still a single teacher determined to inoculate her students, both young and old, against the virus of bigotry. After you do this exercise, when the debriefing starts, when the pain is over and you're all back together and you're all one again, you find out how society could be if we really believed all this stuff that we preached. If we really acted that way, you could feel as good about one another as those kids feel about one another after this exercise is over. You create instant cousins. I thought maybe that lasted just while they were in my classroom because of my superior influence. But indeed, these kids still feel that way about one another. They said yesterday, over and over, the remark was made, we're kind of like a family now. They found out how to hurt one another, and they found out how it feels to be hurt in that way. And they refused to hurt one another that way again. And they said, we're kind of like a family now, and indeed we were. 